everyone. My name is Arkan Fung, and I'm the academic dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's forum. We are honored to have with us President Drew Faust of Harvard University and the 75th Secretary of the United States Navy, Ray Mabus. The mission of the Harvard Kennedy School is to train exceptional leaders and develop great ideas to solve the world's most pressing problems. National security and military affairs are therefore critical domains for both research and training here. We are proud to have one of the most distinguished security studies faculties anywhere in the world. They help us all to understand and solve problems around nuclear proliferation, terror, diplomacy, cybersecurity, human rights leadership, and the constructive uses of both hard and soft power. Educationally, we train many active, former, and future members of the U.S. Armed Forces, as well as military and security services around the world. For example, our National Security Fellows, who are active duty U.S. military officers and U.S. civilian intelligence officers, spend 10 months at the Kennedy School doing research in national security, public management, and political leadership. But those who come to the Kennedy School from military careers and backgrounds give as much to our community as they receive. I have a boy, Alex. He's my son. He's 13 years old. His entire life, this country has been at war. But you might not know that living in Cambridge or working here at Harvard and the Kennedy School. Our ignorance would be much more difficult to sustain were we living, it, were we living in Mississippi, where Secretary Mabus rendered so much of his public service, or in Oklahoma, where I grew up. The most profound decision that a democracy can make is whether to go to war. We the people cannot make decisions about war and peace wisely unless the experiences and consequences of war are well understood by Americans from all walks of life. So to the many members of the military community who have come to the Harvard Kennedy School, I thank you not just for your service, but for the illumination you have brought to us. No one at Harvard better understands the importance of the military to education, to this country's future, and indeed its past than our President Drew Faust. One of the most significant elements of her leadership at this university has been her devoted and courageous efforts to improve relationships between Harvard and the armed forces. Indeed, I have it on good authority that shortly after Ray Mavis became Secretary of the Navy in 2009, he went around the country talking to many university presidents and college presidents to the, prepare them for the, to welcome ROTC back to campus if and when Don't Ask, Don't Tell ended. Many rebuffed him, but President Faust was one of the few who did not. She was ready to explore the path toward deeper connection between Harvard and ROTC. Several years later, in 2011, President Faust led the university to fully and formally welcome back Navy ROTC, the, the Navy ROTC program to campus after Congress repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. At the time, President Faust said it was a step to ensure that any and every Harvard student can make the honorable and admirable choice to commit him or herself to our nation's defense. In recognition of these efforts, U.S. Department of the Navy awarded President Faust its highest civilian honor in 2013 when Secretary Nab uh, Mabus presented her with the Navy's Distinguished Public Service Award in acknowledgment for her total commitment to Navy ROTC. In domestic politics and foreign wars alike, understanding the other side, whether Republican or Democrat, Shia or Sunni, is essential to the successful resolution of conflict whether that resolution takes the form of victory, compromise, reconciliation, or unity. Sun Tzu wrote 2,500 years ago that if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. In a wonderful speech delivered last month at West Point, that other military academy, President Faust argued powerfully that the humanities provide the essential capabilities for achieving such understanding and are therefore indispensable to professional leadership training in the military and elsewhere. She said that the humanities offer a passport to different places, different times, and different ways of thinking. She said that the humanities impart skills that slow us down, the habit of deliberation, the critical eye, skills that give us capacity to interpret and judge human problems, the concentration that yields meaning in a world that is noisy with information, confusion, and change. Please join me now in welcoming Harvard University President and Lincoln Professor of History, Drew Gilpin Faust.
Thank you so much, Arkan. That was excessively generous, <laughs> but wonderful to hear. Good afternoon, everyone. Secretary Mabus, friends, distinguished guests, faculty, Harvard students, colleagues. I'm especially delighted to welcome our alumni, students, and others representing several branches of the United States Armed Forces, and also the members of our community who have worked to create pathways for more men and women here and elsewhere to lead lives in service to their country. Today, I am delighted to join Secretary Mabus in celebrating the five-year anniversary of Harvard's renewed relationship with the Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps. Beyond the past five years, this relationship now dates back 90 years to 1926, when Harvard became one of the six original participating institutions in the Navy ROTC. Harvard's long-standing and renewed relationship with the US military affirms the vital role that members of our armed forces have played in serving the nation from the time here that George Washington first had troops who bivouacked on Har in Harvard Yard. This is a long and storied history. But even as we welcome and support ROTC cadets, active military, and returning veterans, I am mindful that the US military is representative of less than 1% of our national population as fewer and fewer Americans have direct contact with a member of the armed services, we are in danger of becoming what former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Michael Mullen, called a people uninformed. As citizens, we have an obligation to understand our military and to ensure that it and its members do not stand apart from our national life. And as Harvard seeks to shape that society and educate its citizens and leaders, we must necessarily be connected to its military. We must ensure that Harvard students understand military service as a choice to consider and to honor, even if and especially if they end up pursuing other paths. In this regard, I was pleased to learn that ROTC scholarship recipients have been accepted to the Harvard College class of 2020 in higher numbers this year than in recent memory. I hope we can build upon this trend and that Harvard students dedicate themselves to military service in increasing numbers, using their extraordinary talents to play a role in the responsibility and privilege of defending our nation. Today, we owe a special debt of gratitude to Secretary Mabus, who reached out to me with the strong belief that together we could create a relationship that might inspire new possibilities around service, collaboration, leadership, and innovation. When Secretary Mabus spoke on Harvard's campus in March 2011, he said, in order to best serve our nation, the military has to strive to be reflective of the nation it protects, and it does not serve our country well if any part of our society does not share in the honor of its defense. This essential connection between the military and the society it serves underscores why the military is important to Harvard and why Harvard is important to the military. So I am delighted to welcome back to campus and introduce the person who has been a driving force in renewing and enriching this relationship and a truly remarkable leader in our national defense and an alumnus magna cum laude of Harvard Law School, Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Ray Mabus. President Faust, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here today, particularly the midshipmen who are here, uh, the people in uniform, and the people who have worn the uniform, the cloth of America, the veterans who are here, and the people on active duty who are here going to school at this great institution. 
And so I'm going the only, the only slight correction I would make, Dean, is that the very first call I made was to Drew Faust. And she was welcoming and said, let's get this done. And so, Madam President, could I ask you to come back up for just a moment? only in the wrong hands, <laughs> to uh, symbolize the connection between Navy and Harvard. Um, I want to give you something for your office, a Navy saber. Wow. And um, it also makes meetings run faster if, uh, <laughs> when necessary. <laughs> It's, um, it's great to be back here. And again, I want to thank the people in uniform, people who have served this country in various roles, whether in uniform or not. And I'm only going to pick out one or two people in the audience. Um, as President Faust said, 40 years ago, I graduated from Harvard Law School. Uh, last week, my daughter Elizabeth was accepted into the class of 2019 at Harvard Law School, and she is here today. When, um, when President Faust and I signed the memorandum of agreement to bring Naval ROTC back to Harvard after an absence of almost 40 years, one of the quotes that was there that afternoon was by Sir William Francis Butler, who said, a nation that draws too broad a distinction between its scholars and its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its wars fought by fools. Because of the connection between Harvard and our military, we will never become such a nation. Forty years, more than 40 years ago now, Vietnam was almost literally tearing this country apart. And I came to Harvard, to Harvard Law School, immediately after getting out of the Navy. And those two institutions were critical in my formation and in the formation of so many other people. And they were, there was no connection then. The ROTC connection had been broken. Students were against the war, and understandably so. But one of the things that has happened in the decades that have passed is that institutions, and more importantly, the American people, have learned to separate the warrior from the war. And while we may have profound disagreements over when is the proper use of force, of military might, of applications, we never lose our respect for and our gratitude for those who are willing to wear the uniform. Because as, as President Faust said, fewer than 1% of America wears the uniform at all. And that's active duty, reserves, National Guard, everything. And so it's not like it was when I was growing up, or President Faust is much younger than I am, but was growing up. When everyone knew people in the military or who had been in the military. It was almost unheard of that one of your parents hadn't 
hadn't been active in World War II. Both of mine were. My dad was in the Navy. My mom was an auditor for the Marine Corps during that time. But as time has passed, and we have gone to an all-volunteer service, and the, the percentage has shrunk, and the draft is gone, and so you have to volunteer. You have to want to serve. You have to raise your hand and say, send me. The, the connection between our society, our democratic society, and those that protect it has become increasingly tenuous and sometimes increasingly frayed. And that is dangerous in a democracy. That is not a good trend. And it was for that reason that it was one of the first things I did after I was sworn into this office was to call President Faust and say, can we get Naval ROTC back at this iconic institution? And her response was immediate and positive, and she said, all we have to do is repeal, don't ask, don't tell. And the way will be open for it. That happened two years later. And good to her word, shortly after that, we brought Naval ROTC back to Harvard. And I think that it was a, a very good prerequisite that don't ask, don't tell had to fall. You should not be judged on who you love or the color of your skin or your gender. You should be judged on whether you can do the job, whether you can perform the mission for the United States military. And I was Yesterday, almost at exactly this time, I was at Camp Pendleton in California. I was talking to a thousand Marines, most of them brand new Marines, right out of boot camp. They were going through the School of Infantry there and talking to them about gender integration in the military. And how, if you set standards, if, you, if those standards are job related, if you do not relax those standards, then gender becomes irrelevant. Why should it matter? The only thing that matters is can you do that marine job? Can you do that task? And every time, every time we have broadened our military, we have become stronger. When the military was fully integrated in the late 40s, we became a stronger military. When we began to recruit women in larger numbers in the 1980s, we became a stronger military. When we repealed, don't ask, don't tell, we became a stronger military. And when we opened every billet in every service in the Navy and the Marine Corps to include ground combat and SEALs and infantry to women, we became a stronger military. A more diverse force is a stronger force. You do not want people with the same mindset. You do not want people with the same background. You do not want people that think the same way. You will become too predictable. You will become too homogenous. You will become predictable in your thinking. And one of the things that came out of the Marine test to see whether women should be in ground combat was there was an obstacle course and there's an eight foot wall. And when the men went through it, they just kept going one at a time until they got over the eight foot wall. First woman that came had trouble getting over so all the women came and helped her get over and then they helped one another get over. That's the kind of thinking, and somebody's gonna say at some point, why are we going over this wall? Why don't we go around it? <laughs> what? We've got to have that diversity of thought, and that's why 
I'm so happy to, that ROTC is back at Harvard. Harvard trails only, only West Point and Annapolis in Medal of Honor recipients. In 1917, the Boston Globe said, Harvard is a war college because so many of its students were preparing to go to World War I. Go to Memorial Hall, look at the names of the fallen. Go to Langdell at the law school on the second floor, look at the names of the law, of the law students and law graduates who fell in defense of this country. And you will see that close, close tie, which was broken for far too long, which has now come back together. I'm gonna talk just for a moment about the Navy and the Marine Corps. And we are living today in a maritime century. It sounds almost quaint, it sounds historic. When you think of maritime centuries, you think of the great British fleets of the early 1800s, you think of the explorers that four or 500 years ago but this is a maritime century. 90% of trade, $9 trillion a year, goes by sea. 95% of all the data that we do over our cell phones, through the internet, goes under the sea. 80% of the population of the earth lives within 60 miles of the sea. And what the Navy and Marine Corps uniquely give this country is presence. Being not in the right place at the right time, but the right place all the time. We get on station faster. We stay longer. We take whatever we need with us. And because we operate off American ships, which are sovereign American territory, we don't have to ask anybody's permission to get the job done. The best example of that is when the president made the decision to strike ISIS in the summer of 2014. We had a carrier on station in less than 24 hours. And for 54 days, 54 days, we were the only strike option. And it wasn't because we didn't have other aircraft in the region. We did, we had a lot. It was because the countries those aircraft were in would not let them take off armed to strike. We didn't have to ask. The way we get that presence, and you see it every day you know, on your Twitter feed or on television for those of you who are technologically unadvanced like I am, you, you see what we're doing with that presence, whether it's freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, whether it is fighting Ebola in West Africa, whether it is striking ISIS in the Middle East, whether it's responding to an embassy crisis almost anywhere in the world, or whether it's delivering humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to places as far flung as Nepal and the Philippines. So the way we get that presence, and the way I've tried to organize my thinking about the Navy, is through four other Ps, people, platforms, power, partnerships. And I wanna talk about the people and the partnerships the most. So I'm gonna skip a little lightly over platforms and power, but on platforms. In 2001, the US Navy had 316 ships. Seven years later, after one of the great military buildups in our history, we were down to 278 ships. The Navy put 41 ships under contract during those, those seven years. It wasn't enough to keep our fleet from getting much smaller, and it wasn't enough to keep our shipyards open and healthy. I've been secretary now for seven years, the longest, by the way, since World War I. In those seven years, we have put 84 ships under contract, and we've done so with a 20% smaller top line. 
quantity has a quality all its own. We will get back to where we need to be, which is 308 ships by 2021. It takes a long time to build a ship. It takes a long time to turn around a fleet. It takes a long time to regrow and to get the skills back to build these ships. We haven't done it at the expense of aircraft. We bought 40% more aircraft during the same time as well. On power, energy, power, fuel can be used as a weapon. You only have to look at what Russia did in Crimea or the Ukraine or what they tried to do to Europe before the price of oil collapsed to see. I didn't want that weapon used against us. So in 2009, I set some fairly ambitious energy goals for the Navy, the biggest one of which was that by 2020, at least half of all naval energy, both afloat and ashore, would come from non-fossil fuel sources. Ashore, we're there today. We're getting half our power from alternative sources, one gigawatt, which is enough to power a city the size of Orlando. We're doing it with wind and solar and geothermal and hydrothermal. We're doing it all in partnership with the private sector, and we're saving money overall, even with the price of oil being what it is today. At sea, we've certified every one of our ships and every one of our aircraft on biofuels. It's not the old biofuels. These are second generation, third generation biofuels. We only have three requirements. It's got to be a drop-in fuel. The engine can't notice the difference. It can't take any land out of food production, and it's got to be competitively priced. Right now, today, the John Stennis Carrier Strike Group is at sea, and it's been dubbed the Great Green Fleet because the carrier's nuclear, which is alternative, and every ship in that strike group is sailing on a mixture of normal marine diesel and biofuels. And the best example I have of why we need to do something like this is in Singapore. There are two refineries. One is an oil refinery and it's a majority owned by China. Down the road is a biofuel refinery owned by a Finnish company. I don't want to be dependent on that oil refinery to fuel our ships. Now, people, we've got the greatest force we've ever had, but we've stressed it a lot. Our deployments have gotten longer, they've gotten more unpredictable, and as the dean has said, we've been at war for 15 years now. So we've tried to manage our force differently. We've tried to make it more flexible, we've tried to make it a lot easier to combine things like family and service. So some of the things we've done, as I said, all billets, every single MOS, every single MOS, military occupational specialty, I've been in the Pentagon too long, I'm beginning to speak in acronyms, it's time for me to leave, but every single billet is open to to women now. Navy SEALs, Marine Infantry, anything else. We've got a career and a mission program. You can take up to three years off to do anything you want to do. Have a family, care for a loved one, get a degree that we don't see the direct connection, but maybe you do, or maybe you think there's something else out there that you want to study. When you come back, you'll owe us two years back for every year you took off, but we roll you back, and so you're competing against people from three years later, not from, with people who were on active duty the whole time you were gone. First person that went through it um, happened to be a woman. She got promoted to captain and she was given major command the year she came back. I've tripled 
a triple paid paternity leave from six weeks to 18 weeks. We did small things like open childcare two hours earlier and kept it open two hours later because I kept hearing child care opens at 7 in the morning. I'm supposed to report to my duty station at 7 in the morning. Which one am I not supposed to do? We keep gyms open 24 hours a day now so people can work out. And we're trying to get a culture of fitness instead of training for the fitness test twice a, twice a year. So now we... We spot test fitness, you know. You come in one day, it's your lucky day, get your shorts and your T-shirt, time to go do a PFT. We're doing promotions based more on merit than on time in grade. We've got the Fleet Scholar Education Program, 30 slots for junior officers, and the f very first one is here at the Kennedy School. Um, those 30 are today studying Harvard, at Dartmouth, and at the Lesser Institution in New Haven. <laughs> we have SecNav industry tours, uh, working with companies like FedEx and Amazon, where we send people sort of mid-career, go learn some best practices from business, and take some best practices from the military, and then come back, so that we can have that, that sort of interchange. We've got established, which is sort of an oxymoron, an innovation task force. I mean, if, you, if you're having a task force to be innovative, that sort of doesn't compute. But we've got this incredible innovation and brain power out in the fleet, and it just wasn't getting anywhere. So we've, got, we've gone to crowdsourcing, and, and we're funding these things now, and we're getting incredible ideas that are bubbling up. And this task force innovation is now a permanent role, one in Silicon Valley, one in the Pentagon, to make sure that these ideas coming out of the fleet get to the leadership and that the good ones we take action on right away. And finally, there's one thing that's sort of a one-off and People didn't take it seriously when I started talking about it. We're trying to get one uniform for men and women, both the Navy and the Marines. The word uniform <laughs> means the same. Women were wearing different uniforms. And it was a historical anomaly. It was because in World War II, women were joining the auxiliary and not the active duty forces. And they were given different uniforms on purpose to show that they were not active duty. Well, it continued. Now, can you imagine if we ask any other group to wear a different uniform, the amount of trouble we would get in? But we were asking that of women. And the first time I noticed it was at an Army-Navy football game. Now, it was the only bad thing I've ever noticed in an Army-Navy football game since we'd beaten Army 14 years in a row now. <laughs> but when the Corps of Cadets from West Point marched out, they were all wearing the same uniform. You couldn't tell men and women. You just saw cadets. When the midshipmen from Annapolis marched out, you could pick out the women because they had different covers on, they had different hats. And so I went back and we started working on this. We segregate women through uniforms. But now we've got a common cover for the Navy and the Marine Corps, and we're working on common uniforms. Now they're not all going to be common. There'll be a few that, that won't be, but in the main, when you look out, you're not going to see male sailors, female sailors, male Marines, female Marines. You're going to see United States sailors, United States Marines. And we're doing all these things because, as I said at first, a more diverse force is a stronger force. A more diverse force are better 
at the jobs that we are given by this country. And finally, partnerships. I travel a lot. I just went over 1.2 million air miles. 148 different countries in this job. Let me tell you where I've been in the last three weeks, three weeks ago today. I had my last hearing in front of Congress to defend the budget. And as pleasant as that was, I was <laughs> ready to get out of town. So I got on a plane, I flew to Alaska and then out on the ice where I met a submarine and was underway for five days and came up to the North Pole. If you want to know the real effects of climate change, the ice at the North Pole is less than a foot thick. It's the thinnest it's ever been according to the ice pilots that we had on board. Now it was 50 below, but it was still, the ice was literally like, like that. We came back from that, went Central African Republic, Mozambique, South Africa, Gabon, Sierra Leone, Uruguay, back to DC and 36 hours later on Monday we went to, to Northern California, to Silicon Valley, then down to Camp Pendleton, came in here last night. I'm gonna wear a name tag when I go home so that my family will recognize me. Um, and I have one more job to do uh, here in Boston and it's a tough one, uh, but somebody has to do these things. I'm gonna go throw out the first pitch of the Red Sox game tonight. Um, and judging from the last two nights, I may be the best pitcher the, the Sox have had <laughs> during that time. But I do this to go see sailors and Marines where they are, where they're forward deployed. I do this to go see our foreign friends and our allies and how we can build a coalition of navies and naval forces around the world. And as important as those foreign partnerships are, the more important partnerships are here. ROTC at Harvard, the research, 14 research projects here at Harvard right now, working on things like synthetic biological process prosthesis, battlefield triage. And the most important, the most important partnership that we have is with the American people. I'm gonna end as I began. You cannot have a distance between those doing the protecting and those being protected. You've got to have that tie. You've got to have that deep understanding. And the force that's doing the protecting, as President Faust said, has got to reflect the people that are being protected. In a democracy, it cannot be any other way. So going forward, United States Navy, United States Marine Corps will do what they've always done, innovate, adapt, overcome, and we will be ready for whatever comes over the horizon that we have to deal with. So from the Navy, Semper Fortis, always courageous. From the Marine Corps, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Thank y'all very much. Some time for questions and answers. As you know, there are four microphones scattered around the forum area, two on this floor and two up there on those platforms. Uh, for those of you who've been in the forum before, uh, you know the ground rules. All questioners must identify themselves. One per customer, one brief question <laughs> per customer, no speeches. And the definition of a question here is that all questions end with a question mark. So. <laughs> Uh, questions. Yes, sir. 
All right, uh, thank you, Secretary Mavis, for being here this afternoon. My name is Philip Ramirez. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College and a midshipman third class in the ROTC program here. My question concerns the state of ROTC at Harvard. Um, in a recent op-ed, um, another ROTC student at Harvard wrote, today there are only 23 cadets and midshipmen who form the ranks of Harvard ROTC, representing just 0.34% of the student body. This number has not increased with the recognition of ROTC five years ago, suggesting that that change was merely symbolic." End quote. Well, it makes me very happy to hear that Harvard has admitted a record number of students with scholarships to the class of 2020. What other steps would you suggest Harvard and other institutions make to ensure that ROTC's recognition um, leads to growth and um, respect for the um, institution and is not merely a symbolic gesture? Come here a minute. I have a tradition at all hands calls. First question gets a coin. <laughs> <laughs> I read that. This is, there we go. I read that op ed piece and a couple of things. One is what President Faust said, and that is that this year there's a, a large number coming. And I think it takes a while um, to, to do this. Not many people do this anywhere. Um, anywhere in the country. Now, I read the rest of it, and, and I actually think it speaks of success. Because if we're concerned now about how many people are here or what the scholarship pays or things like that, there's not a question of whether it should be here, which was a question before. I'm happy to have the discussions on these sorts of questions because we first had to get past that fundamental question. And it was not an easy thing for President Faust to do, uh, to, to do that. And so I think we're on the right track at Harvard and around the country. I mean, the day after Harvard did it, I got a call in pretty rapid succession from Yale, Columbia, and Princeton. ROTC is back at all those again, um, as well as Rutgers, and Arizona State, which are the two most diverse campuses in the country. Thanks. Hey, Secretary Mavis, thanks for being here today, and uh, thanks to President Faust as well. My name is Dan Fisher. I'm a co-director of the Harvard Veterans Organization and a joint MBA MPP student here. Um, this, uh, that one, uh, the last gentleman actually stole my question. I will touch on another issue, however. Um, so in addition to the ROTC numbers at the college, by our count, we're only tracking one veteran. Um, a, a broader estimate would probably be fewer than five, and that number has also not moved substantially in recent in years. In what? At Harvard College. Um, so my question is, what can the college do uh, to materially increase the, uh, its outreach to veterans in order to get more veteran undergraduates? Well. For one thing, I think there is beginning to be, and I think there, through organizations like yours, but through organizations, you know, I think there is a, a pretty big outreach to people coming out. Um, part of that, you're, you've got a lot more veterans at the graduate school level, at the law school level, and things like that. Part of that is the population that's that's coming out to go to graduate school, to go to, um, to go to law school, to go to business school. I mean, somebody on my staff here was an MBA, public policy uh, degree, um, R. Sullivan from, from here. Um, I think part of it is it doesn't occur to people to apply to Harvard uh, nearly as much coming out uh, without a college degree going into undergraduate. We don't have as many coming out to be undergraduates uh, because so many now during service are t getting the education, you know, the um, education while they serve. And so they've, they've got some college credits and they, they're close to, either close to finishing or 
a year or two in. Uh, and it's harder to get into an Ivy uh, as a transfer than it is straight out. Um, so none of those is an excuse, but I think that, um, I think part of it is, is on us, is on Navy and the other services as you do the transition programs. We've got career path transition programs. Uh, we, we require everybody now a year before they get out to begin to go through a transition and there are different lanes you can go down. One is more education, one is entrepreneurship, and one is vocational. Um, we probably ought to do a better job on the educational track of explaining what the alternatives are um, out there. Thank you, sir. Up here, sir. Yes, uh, Secretary Whoa. Mavis, thank you for coming out. Uh, my name's John Powell. I'm a student at the Kennedy School and a former Marine infantry officer. Uh, I would like to ask you about how you think gender integration is progressing in the Marine Corps, uh, specifically uh, while we've had progress on the enlisted side, uh, women passing training and beginning to be integrated into units. Uh, so far, no women have passed the infantry officer course. And given the setting here, I'd just like to ask, do you think that we're doing all we can or should do in terms of recruiting women college graduates who will thrive in that environment? And or do you think that changes need to be made to training itself? Thank you. Um, well, this is exactly the conversation I had yesterday at Camp Pendleton. Um, and you're not a former Marine, you're, you're always a Marine. There were several questions there. One is, I got that question when I was at IOC, um, the infantry officers course. No women have made it through yet. Some have tried, nobody, nobody has finished. And I got asked the question, if five years from now, no woman has made it through, then what? And I said, then no woman has made it through. Uh, the standards remain the same. It's the same for the Navy SEALs. 80% of men don't make it through. 30% of men, about, don't make it through IOC. So the standards are gonna remain the same. But second, we don't have a lot of people lining up to be infantry Marines. We don't have a lot of people lining up to join the military, period. And I think now that we've opened up all billets, that it will be more attractive to women, that they can see a way to the top. They can see a career that, because uh, to, the surest way to flag officer to general officer in the Marine Corps through the infantry. Um, every commandant except Jim Amos, the last, last one has been infantry, he was aviation. And so now that there is more opportunity there, more, more equality there, if you qualify, I think, I think the recruiting is gonna come up. And finally, one of the things you said, we're not gonna change the training, but Navy buds training to be a SEAL. Everybody knows what you have to do to do that. And so nobody shows up, nobody, that's not physically able to do it. They train, they, they train to the, the standards. Before, and we went through, and people who've gone through IOC or people who went through the Marine test before, no women had ever trained for that test. Um, they were just, went in off, off active, I mean, just went from whatever their job was to do it. I think as you train more at the front end, as you know what the requirements are, what the standards are, that you're gonna see the numbers go up. But, and we're talking about individuals now, we're not talking about averages, we're not talking about units, but we're talking about individuals. And, but I'll repeat my answer. If, if no women make it through IOC, no women make it through IOC. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Midshipman Dabbitt. I'm a freshman here at Harvard College and in Navy ROTC. And um, I guess I'll pose my question with a short anecdote. When I was applying last year um, for my ROTC scholarship, 
I interviewed with the captain and he asked me why I wanted to be in the Navy. And my response was, I wanted to serve my country. And he said that that was actually becoming a more rare response I mean, people applying to academies and for ROTC. So I was wondering, for officers, there are so many opportunities like you know, getting a, a less expensive education, being able to travel, having leadership experience. And for many enlisted people joining the military, it's often a way out of a bad situation. So I was wondering, with all these valid reasons, do you think for a voluntary service that incentives take away at all from the strength of the Navy's mission, or does it strengthen it? Um, I certainly don't think those incentives take away from the Navy mission. But the only thing I would disagree with that, Captain, is that I don't think anybody walks up and volunteers, whether for ROTC or to enlist, that doesn't have a sense of service. It's too hard to not to. It's too hard to do it for money for college or whatever else. You've got to have that notion that you want to do something bigger than yourself, that you want, that there's that service impulse. And I think that it's there. Uh, it may not be articulated, but I just don't think it's, I just don't think people do this deep down for any other reason. I think so. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming. My name is Tyler Smith. I'm a second year at Harvard Business School. I'm also a 10-year active duty veteran, and now I currently serve in the reserves. My question revolves around my experience with having transitioned from active duty into the reserves. And I know there's a significant amount of friction for veterans that are also transitioning into a civilian career. I was just wondering, is this on your radar, and is there any sort of innovations around how to make better use of reserves um, on the active duty side, and so it may allow for a better transition for veterans into their civilian career. What, what branch? I was Navy EOD. Okay. Um, well, we couldn't, we couldn't have operated without our reserves for the last 15 years, uh, particularly in things like uh, individual augmentees, stuff like that. Um, we have not done a good enough job, frankly, in that transition. That's one of the things that this career intermission program, things like that, so that you can shift from the active duty to the reserves, and if you want to come back active duty, you can, um, to make that more seamless. We haven't done as good a job as not just Navy and Marine Corps, but overall, in working with things like the VA. I mean, the DOD's computer system for healthcare still doesn't talk to VAs. How hard is this? And, and we've spent billions of dollars on it, and it still doesn't work. Uh, so a veteran with a, with a health issue has to go through an evaluation under DOD, then has to do the same thing, or much the same thing for the VA. And it takes, we, we, we're lower in the time, but it still takes more than 100 days to, to do that. I mean, that's nuts for, you know, for, the, for people who've done what you did. Um, so I guess the innovations are that we're trying to start earlier in the transition. Um, particularly if you've served for a long time, uh, to have you map out a, what are you going to do? What, what, what are you going to do when you get out? Not just you know, have your retirement ceremony or have, your, um, have the ceremony and then you go out and say, now what? But to have some sort of plan to, to do it. Um, we're trying to, to hook people up earlier with things like education that we were talking about, or things like apprenticeship programs, um, so that they can, I mean, the Marines now, you can do the last 60 days of your service at an apprenticeship program, so that when you get out, you just keep going to the same, same place. But it's a, it has been a rough transition for a lot of people. 
Um, not so much active to reserve, I think, as active out. And uh, if you've got any good ideas <laughs> on how we do it, that's what we got this innovation task force for, call me. Let me know. All right. Thank you all again so much. And uh, MIDS, thank you and good luck. Uh, I hope I'll see you uh, in the fleet. Thanks. Thank you very much, Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you, Secretary Mavis and President Faust, for an extremely important and enlightening discussion.